Welcome once again to the channel and as always I'm really pleased to see you here again. I've enjoyed the interaction in the comments below each video so far in this series and I really encourage you to leave a comment or a suggestion or maybe a question down below. You can be certain that there'll always be someone else who would like to ask the same question as you out there somewhere. Okay, so in this episode we're going to talk about star trails. I have done a couple of videos on this subject in the past and I'll be linking those down below. Now as always I want to remind you to download the workshop guide and the shooting guides from the link down below. That link will take you to my website where you see all the info you need to get those files. Now I know I always mention the PayPal link here but I'm so grateful to you for the support you've given me with the production of this series. I've spent more time on these videos than any other content in the past but I was really keen for it to be available to everyone so that's why it's here on my regular YouTube channel. If you want to financially support me you can but if you can't do that no worries at all. As you know I'm providing downloadable RAW files so you can have a go at editing my images. These are also listed on my webpage. It was good to see a few of these appear on social media this last week and as I've mentioned previously if you do post them I'd appreciate you saying that the original images were not taken by you. Anyway you remember last week we talked about focus stacking and blending and I thought it would be good to remind you of the key points we mentioned in that video. We talked about the fact that not all of our nightscape images need to be focus stacked. It's only when important foreground elements are very close to the camera that it becomes necessary to focus stack. We focus our background sky shots to infinity and in most cases shoot at a very high ISO with wide open apertures. The shutter speed is determined by the focal length of our lens but will usually be between 10 seconds and 20 seconds. When we're shooting our foreground subjects we can close down the aperture and lower the ISO to get a much sharper and cleaner image. Shooting multiple foreground images gives us the most detail and when combined with light painting will greatly enhance the dynamics of our nightscapes. Initial editing is best done in programs such as Lightroom with the more advanced blending aspects requiring Photoshop with its ability to incorporate layer masking to artistically build our final image. Now today's video is a little different to the five previous episodes. I'd like to incorporate a little bit of back to the future into this one. What am I talking about? Well about four years ago I recorded a video entitled Star Trails from Start to Finish which has always been a part of my Nightscape workshop program but it's never been released to the public. But I thought to myself well why reinvent the wheel? So I'm going to show you that video in full as part of this episode. And there's a few things I'd like to point out before I show that video. But the question needs to be asked, what are star trails? I've mentioned in quite a few episodes already that when shooting nightscape images we have to limit our shutter speeds because of the apparent movement of the stars across the sky. Now of course the stars are not moving, we are. The earth is rotating on its axis once every 24 hours or so. So this causes everything in the sky, the sun, the moon and the stars to slowly move from the east to the west every day and night. If we leave the camera shutter open for any length of time under the stars we'll see movement resulting in streaks or trails across the frame and these are called star trails and have become a very popular way to capture the stars in the night sky. One of the really good things about shooting star trails is that you can use pretty much any lens to shoot them. Kit lenses which are often too slow aperture wise to capture pinpoint stars can certainly be used as well as smaller sensor cameras. And the reason for that is that we aren't restricted with our shutter speed. We can shoot whatever time we need so the exposure is brighter and the stars show it better. Now when it comes to star trials there are a few common methods people use to shoot them. You can shoot star trials in one long exposure. Just open the shutter and leave it open for half an hour or an hour or maybe even two hours and then close the shutter. You'll have star trials in camera. 
Now there's not much post-processing required for this method as long as your exposure settings are correct to start with. Another method that's proven very popular in recent years is to shoot dozens if not hundreds of 20 or 30 second exposures one after the other with minimal delay between shots. These are pretty much the same exposure settings that you use to shoot any single frame nightscapes. Now these require a bit of post-processing to join them all up to create the single trails and when that's done they look just like a single long exposure. Now one other method which is pretty much a combination of the two previous methods is to shoot longer exposures maybe somewhere between one minute and perhaps five minutes. Then in post-production these are blended into that same long star trail image. As you'll see in the video I tend to prefer this third method. I think it has the benefits of both methods and most importantly requires a lot less horsepower on your computer to edit the files. Uh, to be honest not many people use single long exposures anymore. This used to be the only way we shot star trials back in the film days but digital noise and workflow these days tends to favour the shorter exposure methods. Now lots of people use the very short single exposure method because it has the great advantage of doubling up as just that single exposures if you wanted to. Um, you, you may have captured an awesome fireball streaking across the sky on one of the shots and with this method you can extract this single frame and have a great solo shot with nice pinpoint stars in the background. The other fantastic use of this method is that you can create a time-lapse video by blending all these images into a sequence showing the star movement across the sky. And these look amazing and it gives the night sky that that awesome sense of beauty and wonder. However, notwithstanding these two advantages, I find that editing and blending foregrounds with hundreds of single frames can be a very daunting exercise. There is dedicated software out there to help manage that, but they are generally not able to do all the layering and blending you may want to do as part of your post-processing workflow, especially when incorporating multiple foreground light painted frames. So that brings us to method number three. Here we take a lesser number of total frames but still have the same exposure time and thus making them easier to edit and blend in post-production. The other big advantage with this method is that we can use substantially lower ISOs to achieve a correct exposure thus eliminating noise from our images. Anyway that leads us to the video. Now, you may not recognise the young man in this video. After all, it was recorded four years ago. But he does seem to know what he's talking about. So, have a look and I'll catch you again very soon. Hello, it's Richard here and today I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step guide to creating star trails. Star trails are both challenging and captivating. But like most things, there's a process that we need to follow to get the best results. For those of you who have attended my Nightscape workshops, consider this a refresher course. Something to help you remember what we did out in the field. Well, speaking of being out in the field, that's exactly where we're heading now. I did say this was a step-by-step -step guide, so our first step is to head out to our shooting location. So here we are at the beautiful Ross Dryler Country House, and this is where we hold our Nightscape workshops and it's a lovely spot to see the stars. One of my golden rules is to scout out the intended location during the daytime so as to get familiar with the site. There's nothing worse than stumbling around in the dark trying to find a location to shoot. It sounds basic, and it is, but I know from experience that it's the most sensible thing to do. Most of the time when shooting star trails, I like to face the camera south so as to capture the full circle of the rotation of the stars. It's actually not the stars moving at all, we are, and that does take a little bit of getting your head around. It's a simple matter of using a compass to find south. Then we need to look at how we're going to compose the shot. Don't skimp on this detail, as it's a vital part of any photographic project. I like to include foreground objects in my nightscape shots, and so I've chosen this old comma truck here, and it's gonna be a beauty. Uh, also, I'll be using a wide angle lens, 
and the trees behind will certainly be part of the frame also. To get the truck, as well as the stars in the shot, I'm going to have to get down really low to maximise the angles. To do this, you'll need a tripod that enables the camera to get really close to the ground. Not having a tripod that enables this will be a very frustrating experience. And to be honest, if you're considering pursuing this form of photography, well, you really just have to get one. I often say that night photography is like shooting in slow motion. Everything takes so much more time. Longer setup, longer exposures, and longer post-processing. So anything that speeds up the process becomes a very welcome addition. Okay, one last thing, bring a chair. Taking star trails is a very lengthy exercise. You'll have to get used to letting the camera do its work. So how about you just relax a little while? Okay, so I'm using a Nikon D750 with a Nikon 14 to 24 f2.8 lens. It's a killer lens. I'll be shooting at 14 millimeters wide open at f2.8, a total of 10 exposures with a duration of three minutes each. This will total 30 minutes when joined together later on. Now you may ask why I don't just do one long 30 minute exposure. That's a great question. You certainly can do a single long exposure, but if you happen to get your settings wrong, you've just wasted half an hour of valuable shooting time. In addition to that, it's a whole lot harder to calculate your light painting time in relation to the total time of the exposure. More on that one a bit later. The other reason I prefer to shoot multiple medium duration exposures is that when blending or stacking these together later to create the final star trail image in software, we have the added advantage of reducing the digital noise generated by our low light images. Many people will shoot lots of lesser duration images of around 30 seconds, but I've found a happy medium to be less images at a medium duration. In this case, three minutes each. So let's go through how to set up the camera to shoot these long exposure shots. Firstly, you'll need an intervalometer like this one. It connects to the camera, controls the shutter speed and number of shots we want, as well as the interval between shots. The interval between shots needs to be very short, otherwise we'll see gaps in our completed star trails. An intervalometer is a very simple device that's invaluable to any photographer when shooting exposures longer than 30 seconds. Most cameras will enable shutter speeds up to and including 30 seconds, but any longer than that, and we need this piece of equipment. So these are my recommended intervalometer settings. Delay, two seconds. Length of exposure, three minutes. Interval between shots, one second. Number of shots, 10. Now, once we have our intervalometer set, and we've set out camera and tripod facing south, including our old truck in the foreground, we're ready to go. Now, if you're not sure of your settings, I'd advise taking a test shot, just to see if everything looks okay. So, let's do that. Now, you'll notice that everything looks okay here, except that you can't really see the old truck. So let's do a little light painting and see what happens. When taking star trails, I usually do all my light painting on just one of the exposures. It doesn't really matter which one, but I usually do it on the first one. Remember that as the exposures are taken, they gather whatever ambient light is available at the time. Then, when combined, the light on each exposure is also combined, usually with wonderful results. Now, all we need to do is set our intervalometer off and relax into a comfy chair and let the camera do all the work. Okay, let's see what we've got. Remember, these images were shot in raw format, so they will need a bit of post-processing to bring out the best in them. So, our job's done here. All I have to do now is pack all this stuff back into the car. But I'll see you back for the post-processing section. And that leads us back to the studio to see how to blend these images into a final amazing photograph. I'll be using Lightroom and Photoshop to create the final image as the two programs communicate seamlessly to achieve this. Okay, so let's get started. Okay guys, well here we are continuing in the studio with our Light Trails tutorial. So we're gonna open up Lightroom, that's our first step. And what I'm going to do with these images firstly is 
import them into Lightroom. So once Lightroom opens up, I'm going to go into Library up here and then go to File, Import Photos and Video. And I'm going to find the images that we are looking for. And here we go. I've just opened up my images and they're all checked. And I'm going to just press down here and say Import. And uh, okay, there they are. There's not very many of them. So I'm now going to go to Library up here, uh, pass there into Develop. And there we are. Now, you can see here all of the images that we took out there on the farm. Now, there's a few more than I um, needed there because remember we did a test shot and I did another shot at the very end where I did an extra layer and you'll notice when I zoom in close on this layer, it's actually focused on the truck. And I do that because what I tend to want to do is add in uh, or focus stacking as they call it. When you look at this second layer down here, which was the one I light painted of the truck, if I go in close and look at that, it's a little bit soft and blurry. Um, I'll explain about that a bit later. But for the purpose of this exercise, what we're going to do simply is uh, work on each of these images and there's 10 of them down the bottom. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I'm going to select those. But I'm, firstly, I'm going to just work on the first one, this one here. Now, what I normally do with my images, just to give you an idea, this is going to be pretty um, basic, okay? I'm not going into, into any in-depth detail here, but I'm going to look at the whites. I'm going to push the whites up a little bit like that. See how it brightens the image? I'm going to drop the highlights a fraction. This is pretty standard for me on my nightscapes. I'm going to boost up the clarity a little bit like so, just to give it that real punch. Okay, now you've noticed I've hardly done anything else because remember I set my white balance in the camera and I like this, this sort of deep bluish tinge to the sky. Um, and also when we light painted the vehicle, remember my, my torch has got that little bit of orange on it. So it gives it a bit more of an orange there, which counterbalances the cool white balance. Okay, so just remember, I've hardly done anything there. That's pretty much standard. You can do whatever you want here, but I'm just giving you some ideas. Now, I'm going to go down to, um, just scrolling down here to the one that says noise reduction. And you'll notice here, um, that's, something I'll just put up to about 25 and the same with contrast I'm going to put those both to about 25 not much else I'm going down that's it on that image I like the look of that image there's not much else I have to do okay so what I'm going to do is copy those settings from that particular shot onto all of the others okay so what I'm going to do here is simply hold down control on my keyboard command on the Mac and click on them one at a time like that. Now, um, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've got two extra images here. Um, and that one there, remember, I mentioned about uh, I did that, that as an extra layer. But for the purpose of this exercise, I'm just going to go with these ten. Okay, now I've got them all selected. What I'm going to do then is press sync. You'll see over here down the bottom on the right hand side, press sync and check all. I've got check all here. That means every adjustment I've made on that first image, when I press synchronize here, is going to be applied to all of the other images. So I'm going to press synchronize and you can see instantly all of these images here have got that little check mark on them, which means that they've all got the same adjustments. I've adjusted the uh, highlights, whites, and the clarity. That's all I did, plus a little bit of noise reduction. All right, so that was over here in the basic pull down here. All right, so now what we're going to do, I'm going to take all of these images into Photoshop. Now, it's really easy to do when you're using Lightroom because the two integrate together beautifully. So whilst they're all highlighted still, you can see that, I'm going to right click on any one of those images and go up here where it says Edit In. And then opens up a dialog box here and there's all sorts of options. The one I'm going to be looking for is this one down the bottom that says open as layers in Photoshop. So I'm going to click that. Now this takes a little while because uh, to open up their raw files, 
they're quite large files out of the D750. So it's going to open Photoshop and what it's going to do then is load, here it comes now, all of these layers individually, one at a time, into Photoshop. So what we'll do here, we'll just wait for that to happen and, uh, and we'll continue on our way. Okay, there we are. Now we've got all of our images stacked one on top of each other over here on the right hand side. This is the Photoshop um, screen. Uh, the one that you see on the screen here is whatever is on the top. You see these little eyes here. Now what I normally do, you'll notice that this first image when I uncheck the eye, everything goes to the dark uh, background, uh, foreground where the truck is because that's the first one is the one we light painted. So what I normally do is put the light painted image on the bottom. So I just drag it down to the bottom of the stack like that. Now you'll see that the image we're looking at here is actually this top one over here. And if I was to turn all of these off, I'd see the one directly underneath it. That's how Photoshop works. Layers. Now, what I'm going to do is click here and highlight that layer. All you do is click on whichever layer you click on is the one that's highlighted for those of you who don't know Photoshop very well. And what I'm going to do, this is a really simple operation. I'm going to go to this blending mode. It's, it's called um, blending mode and that's normal is what comes up as a, as a default. I'm going to press that little down arrow and go to lighten. And you'll notice when I did that, um, everything changed here. So what I'm going to do is do that on every layer and you watch what happens. And there we go. Now what you've, you, you will notice there is that we've actually added in the star trails from every shot and they've been blended together to make one complete image. Now you'll be looking at this picture and saying there's something wrong with those trails. If you zoom in a bit closer on them you can see there's gaps and they're disjointed. Well I can tell you the reason for that is because there was clouds in the sky. When you have a cloudy sky you'll get gaps in your star trails, which makes sense because you're seeing through the clouds to actually get to the stars. Um, and unfortunately, on the night that I was out at Rostrata taking these pictures, there was cloud. And you can see the cloud actually adds to the image down the bottom here because it, 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 it's a nice glow in the sky. But uh, unfortunately, you get these um, gaps in the clouds. But for the purpose of our training here, it doesn't really matter. You can see the effect that we've got here. Now, interestingly enough, I didn't apply, you'll notice on that bottom layer, I didn't apply any blending mode because I don't need to. That's the base layer. And once we're looking at that image, well, you can see that that's the combination of all 10 of these shots with our light painted foreground layer on the bottom. And it looks pretty cool. Okay. All we have to do now, well, there's a couple of things you could do with this if you wanted to. I'll briefly show you. Um, if you wanted to move something or take something out of the image, for example, these lights down the bottom here, that's cars going along the highway. If I wanted to get rid of those, I'm not saying I do, but if I did, I've got to find the layer that they're on. And to find the layer they're on, I'm turning off layers. Now, see that one there? I just turned it on and off, and the cars are there. So I click it over here. That's that fourth one down from the top. I'm clicking that layer. I'm going to go over here to the clone stamp tool over on the left hand side. Uh, just make the image a little bit bigger so I can see it. And I'm just going to really, really simply clone that out. It's pretty easy to do. For those of you who have used Photoshop, you'll be doing this uh, a lot. And see that? I just cloned that out. Now, there's obviously a little bit there which is on a different layer. So we're going to have a look at that in a minute. But pretty much on that layer, that's all gone. So let's continue down and find out where that other little bit is. I think uh, it's 
Okay, well, it's on the bottom layer. So what I'm going to do here is select the bottom layer here, go back to the clone stamp tool, um, and just go over it like that, and it's gone. So now when I turn all these layers back on, like so, oh, okay, well, there's one. So that top layer there has, has um, car lights in it. So what I'm going to do, this happens a lot when you're taking star trails because you're taking the same framing, the same shot over and over. You get the same thing happening quite frequently. So this is very common, but I'm just cloning that out. See how I did that? It's really easy to do when you have a black background like this. It's really, really easy. So there we go. All gone. And back to the full, full screen view again. And there we go, the lights are gone. Now some people couldn't care less if the lights are there or not. You know, other people, they prefer a cleaner looking image. Okay, so if we're finished editing in Photoshop, what we do now is we just click out of Photoshop like so. It says, do I wanna save the changes? I say, yes. And what it's doing, going to do now is take me back to Lightroom. When I get back to Lightroom, I will have a flattened image a single flattened image of all of those star trails together. And it'll put it on the end of our stack down here. And you can see that that's just loading up now, and there it is. So it's as simple as that. Having all of our star trails together, um, blended in Photoshop um, from Lightroom. I haven't had to really exit Lightroom, to be honest. I'm still there. It just took me to, to Photoshop straight away. So it's a pretty simple exercise. Now, as I said, if we didn't have a cloudy sky, these trails would be beautiful circles. But unfortunately, um, on the night that I was there, there was quite a lot of cloud and that's what interrupted the, the trails. But you can get the, ex the, um, the gist of what I'm saying here. And I think it looks pretty awesome. Uh, as I said to you uh, originally, I did create a, um, this one here, a layer which has the, the old truck in focus. Now, what I'm going to do is show you how to put this image in instead of the one I used. Now, the one I used is fine, and you can see this is what it looks like. When you zoom in close, you can see the image of the truck is actually quite a little bit soft. And when it's uh, drawn back in, in the frame like it is there, it doesn't really, you don't really notice it so much. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you the same thing, but this time, I'm going to select, well, firstly, I'm gonna copy the, uh, this layer settings onto that layer. So I do that by simply selecting previous. And now it's got those layers. And I'm gonna actually select, I'm gonna show you this whole process once more. But this time, I'm gonna add in the foreground layer with the focus truck. So notice I've got 10 layers selected again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And for good measure, I think I might put this one in and sync those up. So they all have the same settings, all of those layers. I'm gonna press edit in. Remember we went down to open as layers in Photoshop. And we're gonna go through that whole process again. I'm gonna show you what to do. This time, uh, and it takes a while to open up in Photoshop as it did last time. So just bear with me and we'll see what happens. Okay, here we are. They're all opened up as layers here in Photoshop. So what we're going to do, and this is really simple, and I'm gonna repeat the process to make it easy for everybody to understand. We just select each layer separately, go into the blending mode here and change it from normal to lighten. And it adds each image to the one below it. So we go lighten and again, Lighten, do that with all of these layers. Lighten, lighten. See how the, the star trials are forming? Almost as if by magic. Now, the main reason we uh, have a very short exposure time between all of our images is because we don't want gaps in the star trials. Now, unfortunately, we've got gaps in our trials mainly 
as I said, because of the cloudy uh, night sky. When the clouds roll across, they create these gaps. And unfortunately, this particular night, it was uh, cloudy. Now, you'll notice I've put this light painted image on the bottom. And when I take that one out, you can see the foreground is lit quite well here. But one thing you will notice, and to illustrate this point, I'll just turn off all these other layers. The stars are gonna be out of sync in this layer. And I say that because there was probably a time delay between the sec second last and the last image. So the way I normally go around that is I just delete all of the sky. There's a few ways of cutting out that image in Photoshop. I'm gonna do it the most simple, basic, easy way you can imagine and get the eraser tool and simply erase it out just like that. Now I've gotta be careful not to erase out any of my car or my foreground. So I'm gonna make the brush a lot smaller when I get down near the, near the bottom. But you get the gist of what I'm doing here. I'm actually just taking the stars out of the background because I don't need them. They're in all the other images. Now this is as rough and ready as it gets. And I'm doing this deliberately because I'm showing you that you don't have to be a Lightroom guru to be able to do what I'm doing here. This is really, really simple. I'm just creating this. Is, remember, I've highlighted that bottom layer. I'm just cutting out the sky and in a really, really rough way. I haven't gone too close to the car because I don't want to rub the car out. The car's only on this layer. Okay, all I do then, turn every other layer back on and we have our stars and our sky back. See that? All there, but this time we've got a, a really, really sharp, crisp truck. Remember last time it was a little bit blurry? Not anymore because that was focused. It's called focus stacking. And I've actually focused that last image differently to all the rest. Okay, so what we're going to do now is, I won't bother uh, cloning out those lights. You could do that if you wanted to. All you have to do is uh, find which layer those car headlights are there, which are off in the distance on the main highway, and just clone them out. But I won't bother with that. It's just time consuming right now. I'm gonna cross out of Photoshop here. It asks me if I wanna save that. I say yes. And what's going to happen now, it's going to take me back to Lightroom. That's the thing I love about these two programs. They just work together seamlessly. I've only opened up Lightroom, to be honest, and it automatically went to Photoshop to do this work. But you can see how easy that was to actually blend those together. Okay, so here we have our completed image with our nicely, beautifully focused truck in the foreground. Isn't that lovely? If I look at the one we did a minute ago, which is this one, and zoom in on the truck, you can see it's a lot blurrier and softer. So if I go to the, the one we just did, see how much better that looks? That's, as I said, it's called focus stacking. I do it all the time with my images when I take them, when I shoot them. It's, it takes a little bit more time, but when you're doing something like this, it really does make a difference. Okay, so there you have it. That's how you make star trails in Lightroom and Photoshop. And I hope that is uh, explained well. It's pretty simple and you guys just need to have a go and see how you handle your shots now. So let's go back and recap all the shooting details. Scout out a location in the daylight hours. Set the tripod low and steady, facing south. Select a suitable wide angle lens. Set your aperture somewhere between f2.8 to f4. Make sure your focus is set to infinity. Line up a foreground object of interest. Set your camera to bulb mode. Set the white balance to 3450K or whatever look you're particularly desiring. Attach and set up the intervalometer. Delay, two seconds. Long to three minutes. Interval to one second. Number to 10. And I prefer to turn the sound off as it drives me crazy sometimes. Press start and take a rest in your comfortable chair and let the camera do its stuff. And don't forget to light paint your foreground, if possible, on one frame. It doesn't matter which one. Practice this, as it does make a huge difference to the final image. And when the image is complete, post-process using Lightroom and Photoshop, as previously demonstrated. Well, there you have it. Star trials from start to finish. I hope this lesson's helpful to you, and I really look forward to seeing some amazing images as you put this information into practice. I'll see you next time. So that's my reasoning for shooting star trails. They're a pretty simple and rewarding way to capture nightscapes, 
And as I said previously, you don't really need top-notch camera equipment to do so. Now, I did touch on it briefly in a video, but I think one of the greatest benefits of shooting star trails is the fact that we can spend an extended time relaxing under the stars and do nothing but enjoy the view. I've done that on many times, often with others, and it's always a really enjoyable experience. I'll often say to people, it's like taking time out to watch the world go round, literally. Anyway, that's all I've got for you in this episode. I'll list a couple of my other videos relating to star trails here down below as well. And I'm always just so grateful to you for supporting my work here on the channel. And I very much value your comments and suggestions in the comment section down below. Don't forget the downloads linked underneath this video. And I've included the original files of the star trails shown in this video. Anyway, I'll look forward to seeing you for another episode real soon. I'll see you then.